So please continue to be safe wearing your mask and maintaining proper social distance between non-family members. And also, um, we'll just, uh, we'll get through this. Everybody, we will get through this. Um, we are at the point of ordering books for our next Bible study, which will start on April the 14th. We are reading the New Testament in a new, in a different order. So we're going to uh, be studying that and uh, hope that you will uh, be a part of that. So it'll be a good study. It's an eight week study. So it'll take us all the way through the first Wednesday in uh, June. If you'd like to be a part of that, please let me know so I can order books for you. I believe uh, that they are about uh, 10 or $11, something of that nature. So not too expensive if you'd like to participate. We'll be still using Zoom for right now so that we can continue to bring people from both churches together, but also allow us to do that um, and maintain our uh, concern and our care for uh, the virus. So, all right, uh, let's see. This week is also a church council meeting on Tuesday. So. Council meeting on Tuesday for those who are part of that. So just to remind you. All right. May we join together for our opening prayer. O oh, merciful Father, in compassion for your sinful children, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the Savior of the world. Grant us grace to feel and to lament our share of the evil that made it necessary for him to suffer and to die for our salvation. Help us by self-denial, prayer, and meditation to prepare our hearts for greater penitence and a better life. And give us a true longing to be free from sin through the deliverance won by Jesus Christ our Redeemer. Amen.
join together for a moment of silent prayer, our pastoral prayer, and our Lord's prayer. Let us pray. with us. Our journeys are never, <laughs> they're never clear. Where we're going today is not someplace we would have imagined last week. And the things that you call us to do and the people that we will see are people we would not have encountered otherwise. But you lead us through every day. You give us opportunities to be a witness to your love. You ask us to share the light, to share the witness of Jesus. And so, Father, we come to you thanking you that you touch us and remind us how much we are loved. And then you call us to say, will you tell others? And indeed, O oh Lord, we come offering ourselves that we might be a part of that. Precious and loving God, there are needs in our hearts, there are needs in our nation, there are needs in our world that you have the power to bring healing to, to help people through and to give strength and comfort, assistance. Lord, we need that. We need your very presence with us at all times. So we ask, O oh Lord, that you will touch all of us and remind us that you are working things out beyond what we can know. And that through this working out, there will be great, great and wonderful things in this world for all to experience. We pray, Father, for our congregation and for our place in this community, asking that you lead us in reaching out and helping those around us to experience God's love through our light, through the love that you shine into us. May we be a part of helping them to experience your love too. And we pray, Father, that you will guide us, that our lives might be a witness everywhere in all things. Precious and loving God, we make this prayer as we make all of our prayers. And the precious loving name of Jesus, our Savior. And as he taught us, so now we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm getting out of work here. I can do that. I want to take a moment now to invite you to stand where you are and to turn and greet one another. And uh, we'll get you, if we can, to uh, turn and greet the camera as well. We're going to spin it around and uh, let everybody see you so that... Uh... <laughs> yes, there she is. Good morning, everyone. standing, I invite you to uh, hear this affirmation of faith for today. We are reading number 888 from our hymnal. 
This is the good news which we have received and which we stand and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. A word of thanksgiving for your continued support of the congregation and its mission and ministry. We have offering plates at both major entrances for you to re leave your tithes, gifts, and offerings, but there's also a box with a little bit more confidential nature to it if you choose to use that. Either way, we thank you and encourage you in that. The journey continues as Jesus moves closer and closer to Jerusalem journey of equipping the disciples to carry on the ministry when he has returned to his father. And so we read of his teaching and very important words these are. Hear these words from the Gospel of John. We're in the third chapter reading verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May we pray. O oh Lord, come and shine your light into our lives, and may we bear your light into this world. And I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts may be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strong rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know exactly when it took place, but at some point in life I figured out that it was easier to work one of these maze puzzles by starting at the end and going back to the beginning. That's always been a whole lot easier for me. It, it cuts down on the number of options and the false paths that I have to avoid in order to get to where I want to go. So I, I start in the end and when I get done then I can say, ah, I did it, yay! and I check it off. So in a results-based model, it works. If it is designed to make me sit there and struggle, well, I guess I'm going to avoid that as much as possible. Working from the end and moving back to the beginning has benefits in many things, and one of them is in struggling sometimes with text especially from the Bible, when we're reading something, it's nice to go to what the end is and then find our way back to how did this come to be? Where did this start? And today's text is a perfect example of that. One of the things that we really like is light. We've talked about darkness, and darkness really is uh, the, the absence of light. When we don't have light, it's dark. We have a hard time with darkness 
Darkness is difficult to navigate. We attempt to do anything in it and, well, so oftentimes we can't even accomplish the minor, most minor of tasks in the dark. If you've ever tried to dig a hole in the dark, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Finding that edge and putting your foot on the shovel and all that, it, it's very hard to do. But you know, there are some things that people prefer to do in the dark. They don't want people seeing what they're doing. And so darkness is a perfect cover. People who do evil, people who are out to hurt others, they do it under what they consider to be darkness so that they don't, uh, they don't have anyone see them doing it. And that then creates that, that perfect cover for them. They think that nobody knows and they can get them away with it. They can slide by by doing it in the dark. The, uh, the beginning of um, the Gospel of John has a, a very, very intentional, intentional words that talk about the coming of Jesus. It says, in the beginning was the Word. Now we understand that the Word is reflective of Jesus. We're talking about this is the Word that has come, and this Word is both with God and is God. And in the Word, we experience something. In the Word is life, and that life is the light of the world. We experience then in Jesus this very presence of light, the thing that we are, we are anticipating helping us, that we need in order to get by. Because if you are stumbling around in the dark, you are going to trip, you'll fall, you may fall into that hole that somebody dug in the dark. You want to be able to see where you're going, and that's a, that's a struggle sometimes. But you need light to be able to find your way. Light, though, comes in many different forms. You can have the momentary bright flash of a strobe light, sometimes designed to stop action so that it can be frozen and you can see it clearly. There's no movement. You can have light such as we have here today, which provides a nice glow. It illuminates so that we can have a, a good view of people when when they're just sitting or when we're uh, praising or when we're trying to read our our bibles we can have that light and it enables us to accomplish things that we cannot do if we just have the momentary flash of light that light also though exposes everything we can see clearly and if you take and adjust the brightness and you adjust the angle and you adjust the type of light you're using well you can see far more you can understand great things if you have just uh, control over the type of light that you're using that makes a big difference when we talk about jesus being the light though what jesus then provides is this this ability to understand who we are and what we're doing and also what is going on around us we like to to see and and to understand to, if we are to be a part of that we've got to have something that helps us to understand be able to move forward and that's what light does for us it gives us that ability to move forward when Jesus is talking at this particular moment, we're then seeing that, that he is saying that those who do not like the light, those attempt to hide away. They don't want to come into the light. They don't want to see anyone to see that their deeds are evil. Whereas the people who do good things want the light to shine so that others may see and give praise to the one who is light, the one who enables us and gives us that ability to go forward. When Jesus is, is talking to them, he says, you know, this, this light reveals the Father's love because what was happening was people had this fear that God somehow didn't care that maybe God had just sort of started the world in motion and that they could then sit back and go, oh, I'll wait and see what they do with it. Whereas I'll just sit in and watch. And the people needed to know that there was someone who would be walking with them. And in order for them to have this understanding, 
He used that, that illustration of light so that they would see that what God provides then is love in the form of light. That light being Jesus who then comes to shine the way that we are to walk and help us to go on that path. With that light, then we can begin to say, oh, okay, now I can understand better where it is God is calling me to go, how he's asking me to be a part of what this world is, uh, is doing and needing to accomplish. At this point, he then takes a move and he goes back to the Exodus. Now, when the Jews were coming out of Egypt, they had lived for so long under slave conditions that they needed to have their whole attitude adjusted. We like attitude adjustment, don't we? We like that idea. It makes us say, okay, I'm going to start living for something instead of responding to something. And here, as they came, they were learning to live under the providence of God, God's provision for them being given to them as they had need, as they then came and said, help me, God would provide. But occasionally they would get so frustrated with it taking so long and things not being the way they liked it that they would complain. Oh, nobody's ever complained about things being slow, have they? <laughs> you know, it's only been a year since we've been struggling with this. I went back and found the uh, original email that I sent out back in March of last year. It's been a whole year now. And said, the bishop has asked us to close down for two weeks. <laughs> two weeks. Okay. And here we are a year later still struggling to get past the mask and get back to the point where we can just have free worship once again. Uh, we will get there. God is good. So, as they were coming out of Egypt and traveling, they got to the point where they just complained. There's, you know, I don't like the food. I don't, there's no water. You know, it's hot. I don't like just traveling and traveling. And I don't like doing all of this. And God got a little fed up with them and he caused serpents, poisonous serpents, to come in amongst them. And these serpents would bite them and they would die. Well, they, they recognized that their, their whining against God, their, their moaning and complaining had caused God to do this. And so they came to Moses and said, we are wrong in, in speaking bad about God. Pray for us that, that we can have some relief from these serpents. And God told Moses to cast uh, a bronze serpent. Take, pour it out, make one, and put it on a pole. And then when you raise the pole up and anybody who's bitten could then look upon that serpent and they would be healed. They wouldn't die. Using this illustration of God's Mercy, God's love, being lifted up before the people and saying, here, look upon this and you will not die, then is carried forward into what is about to take place in Jerusalem. And that is that our Savior, who is the one who gives healing, who gives us wholeness, who rescues us out of our brokenness, this is the one who will be lifted up and all the people who will look upon him will then say, I can now live because I've seen God's rescue, this healing lifted up for me. And looking upon that, I will be saved. You know, that then begins to help us to understand that what God is asking us to do and what he's asking us to see is that his provision has always been a provision of love. I have shown you love in the things I've created. I have shown you love through my mercy. I have shown you love through these guidelines that were designed to help you to understand how a proper life should be lived and what you needed to do. I have shown you love in everything I've attempted and everything I've done. And you still had trouble understanding just what that love fully means. So I'm going to show you once again in a love that will never leave you. And he, should, he gives us Jesus the Christ. 
And in Jesus the Christ, the expression of love is so true, so pure, so whole, that looking upon it, we live, we have life. Whereas those who will not look upon, those who then turn away and say, I don't believe it, I will not accept it, do not. We talk about eternal life. And Jesus addresses that in this text. And we go, what are we talking about? What is eternal life? Do we imagine as a... a television and programs tend to produce it as someone who lives forever without aging someone who constantly walks through the centuries and shows no effects from it or is it something beyond that because what we know is that he's talking to people who have always died in the physical sense and he's talking to people now who know that at some point our physical existence will cease what does he mean by eternal life? And from all that I read and from all that I understand, I get this, this, this impression that what God is asking us to understand is that our lives blend in with all of creation. That those who've gone before us and have paved a way, who have shown us God's love in action, lead into a time where we live and joining with them our lives join that witness so that we too point to the God who loves and never leaves us and this witness then will go on and through ours and in that way our lives do not cease but instead are joined together with a great cloud of all witnesses and we live in that cloud forever, working with those who will come before and come after. We are told that we don't understand this now, and they're exactly right. We don't understand this. But what we do understand is that God's mercy is always present and always freely given. His love is expressed in every way that he can imagine to express it. And our ability to receive that love and take it in then enables us to be a part of what God is doing. How we will then go forward and how we'll be a part of this journey of, of living and caring for others. So the lesson that he was giving to the disciples was an important one. He was seeking to help them understand that they play a part in helping to people to see how their lives are part of this ongoing journey. And that in that ongoing journey, they and we will help to further this, this kingdom of God, this land of mercy and, and forgiveness, this time of compassion and healing, a time of helping, time of giving hope. Our journeys are a long way from done. And this season of Lent asks us to take a look at ourselves and to examine how we are participating in sharing God's love with others. And so today I want to encourage you to take time during these days and to look at how God's love is shining through into your life and there to find that which will be your guide, your help, going forward helping others to know God's love too we've got we've got time and we've got opportunity and we've got witness may we use them to give God the praise and to help others to know that love for their lives too that indeed all may be saved in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen. May we pray? Oh, loving Father, we thank you that your love never fails. It never gives up. And it never runs out. Help us, oh Lord, to bear the witness of that love into the world that all may know you and there find eternal life. For, Father, we praise you in the name of Jesus and through his holy name. Amen.
And so be strong, be courageous, be steadfast in your faith, and let all that you do be done in love. Amen.